This is a video about sequences and limits. This is probably part one of a multiple part video over sequences and limits. So what's a sequence? A sequence of real numbers, it's just an infinite list. And we're gonna denote the elements in the sequence like by x1, or maybe not elements, terms in the sequence, by x1, x2, x3, so on. In general, there's the nth term, and then there's the n plus one term, and it keeps going. So it's this infinite list and some notation for sequences. So typically we're gonna denote uh, a, a sequence like above by one of these two. I'll use parentheses with xn uh, a lot more often, um, or I'll use this capital letter X. But depending on you know what book you're looking at, some books use brackets instead of parentheses. And uh, another notation for it is with this parentheses xn such that n is a natural number. Um, if you're wondering, that kind of looks like a set. How come they didn't use the curly brackets? The parentheses are supposed to respect that there's an order to the sequence. Whereas, remember with the curly brackets, when you're writing a set, the order doesn't matter for the elements that are inside of it. Okay, so let's try and uh, look at some examples of some sequences. So maybe I'll list out a few terms here. So what have I got? One, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. I'm looking at those, and so you're always starting at x1. So x1 is one, x2 is a half, and so on. And what we would like to be able to do is, is there a convenient formula so that I could write this as xn? Is there a formula for what the nth term looks like here? And if you look at this, this is like, uh, what, one half to the zero, this is like one half to the one, one half squared, one half cubed, uh, one half to the fourth, and so on. But maybe you see that my index is a little bit uh, a little bit ahead of that. So in order to adjust for that formula there, xn should be one over two to the n minus first power. Or another way to say that is one half to the n minus first power. So that would be a formula for this sequence. Let's do another one. One minus one, one minus one. So if I list it out, I've written x1, x2, x3, and x4 for you there. And what we'd like to do is talk about, you know, what's a formula for this? And I see I just keep bouncing back between these uh, one and negative one in the sequence here. So it's probably gonna be minus one to some power. And just to make sure you count it right, if you had minus one to the n, if that was your guess, then when n starts at one, right? Minus one to the first would be minus one. That's not where my sequence starts at. So you just need to adjust that n uh, exponent a little bit. So I said n plus one. You could have also used n minus one, doesn't matter. So lots of, lots of answers for what this exponent could be, but not just n in this case. Um, what else? A pretty common one we need to be comfortable with, really just how do you denote an even number or an even natural number? Remember it's two times n for some number n, for some natural number n, and the uh, odds will use two n minus one. So those would be the sequence uh, sequences for each of those. By the way, I mean, we'll use xn a lot of the time, but it's pretty typical in textbooks to use really any letter that they want sub n. You just know that's a new sequence. So what is another common type of sequence that we'll run into? How about a recursive or an inductive sequence? So those are just synonyms for each other. So what does it mean to be recursive or an inductive sequence? Uh, the nth term is just defined in terms of the previous ones. So maybe one of the most famous recursive sequences is the Fibonacci sequence. So I'll denote it by uh, parentheses with fn, and let me tell you how it's defined. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you that the first term is just one. I'll tell you the second term is also one, but now I'm gonna give you a formula that'll tell you how to get every term after that. And what we're gonna do is we're just going to add the two previous terms, and that's the next one. So f sub n plus one is equal to f sub n minus one plus f sub n. So what could I do? I could tell you what uh, f3 is. By the way, that last part is called the recursion formula. So you'd use that to find the rest of the terms for all n greater than or equal to two. So for instance, f3, by the formula there should be f1 plus f2, and those are the two values that I was given. One plus one is two. So the third term in the Fibonacci sequence is two. I could now find f4. It should be f2 plus f3, right? The sum of the two previous terms to f4. That's one plus two, which is three. And then I'll do one more. f5 would be f3 plus f4, and you see that that should be five. And you carry on this way to get all the elements, or I'm sorry, all the terms in the Fibonacci sequence. Now let's talk about the limit of a sequence. So the sequences, right? It's an infinite list of just real numbers. So if you're given a sequence, as n goes to infinity, in other words, as you're looking really far down in the terms, right, you're super far into your sequence, what do those numbers xn actually do? So in particular, do they tend toward or cluster around or do they get close to some number l? And I put quotations around uh, those phrases there because we need to try to make that precise. So it could be helpful to maybe graph a sequence to help with some intuition for what we're really looking for here. 
So I've picked a sequence, xn is just the sequence one over n, so like one, one half, one third, one fourth, etc. And another way you can think about sequences is as a function. So I write it as this function, capital X, and it inputs a natural number and it spits out a real number. And so uh, how you should read this formula then is like something like x of one is just the first term in your sequence. So in my case, it would just be one. x of two would be well, the second term in my sequence, so that would just be one half, and so on. So you can think of these sequences always as a function from the natural numbers to the reals. And the only reason I'm saying that might be helpful here is because I can graph. I can graph pretty well. I passed college algebra barely, and so we're here. So I could graph this function x, and uh, what I've tried to emphasize is in blue, that's the domain. Those are the natural numbers I care about. And in green, those are the outputs. And then I've just you know, plotted those ordered pairs, and you get those red points. You can see the graph of this function here. And what, again, I want to look at is as n goes to infinity, that's just as you go farther and farther to the right, can you tell me about what's going on with the red, and therefore what's going on with your sequence, the green, right? What's going on with your y values? And maybe what we see here is that as I go farther to the right, it looks like the points, the red points, or, or um, equivalently, the green y values, they're getting lower and lower, closer and closer to zero, which I've highlighted there in purple. But we need to try to make this stuff precise. So again, as n goes to infinity, in other words, as you go to the right, it looks like the red points get close to the x-axis, which means that your y values, the green numbers, get close to zero. So how do we make this precise? How do we formalize this idea that the limit of one over n as n goes to infinity, should be equal to zero. Um, let's see, one more thing here. Remember when we say limit for sequences, it's pretty common that they won't even put the n goes to infinity. So if you just see lim right there, you know that you're dealing with the limit of a sequence. So how do we formalize this idea though that sure, those red points, my sequence in green, they should be getting really close to zero. So when n is large, whatever large means, we need a precise way to say that xn, you know, that term in the sequence, is close to zero. And we need a precise way to say, to describe this concept of close. And that's where, you know, your mathematical language comes in. The fact that math is kind of a language, we're going to have a way to describe precisely what it means to be close. So what I want to try to do is give you some intuition for what's behind this idea of being close. So if you look at x1, which is 1, that has distance 1 away from your limit, 0. So what we want to have happen is that eventually, maybe not immediately, but eventually down the line, I want all the terms in the sequence to have distance at most one from zero. So in other words, none of these red dots out here should ever pop out so that the distance from the origin or the distance from the x-axis is any more than one. It always needs to be less than that. So x2 is a half, and the distance, and so, you know, x2 has distance one half from your limit zero. So your supposed limit zero. So again, eventually what we expect is that all the xn up to some point, or after some point I mean, they should have a distance up at most one half from zero as well. So maybe you see what I'm doing. In general, xn is one over n. I know that that has distance one over n from zero. Eventually I expect all the rest of the terms in the sequence for m greater than or equal to n to have a distance one over n, at most one over n from zero. That's what I should say there. So again, as you go farther out in the sequence, you should actually be getting close to that limit. Now what I want to do is reformulate this a little bit uh, in a different way. So given any positive number epsilon, can we ensure that eventually xn, the terms in your sequence, eventually are those terms at most distance epsilon from zero? And the real power with that, right, is that for any epsilon you pick, maybe it's point zero 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 one. can you tell me how far in your sequence you need to go so that every term after that point is within epsilon of your limit, in this case, zero. And so we're gonna spend some time looking at that. So in this case here, if you were to pick any epsilon and you put this little window around zero here, which I've drawn for you in yellow, can I find some natural number n so that every one of my sequence points to the right of that is within that little yellow window? And I've drawn that picture for you over here. That it looks like in my picture, whatever that n there in orange is, once you're past that, every red point to the right of that is within that little epsilon window. And that's really the big idea for how we're going to define the definition of what it means for a sequence of points of real numbers to converge to a number L. So what does this mean? What's the definition we're going to be working with? In the next few videos, so given a positive number epsilon, there exists a natural number n such that for all indices little n larger than or equal to that special n, 
the terms xn satisfy this distance requirement. In other words, the distance between the rest of your terms and the supposed limit is smaller than that epsilon. So some things to note from this, that n, this there exists an n, it usually depends on what epsilon is. And so some texts will try to uh, really emphasize that relationship by using function notation. Instead of n, they'll write k of epsilon, and that'll be a natural number there in order to denote that. So um, what else? Some stuff from maybe a proofs class. For any epsilon someone was to give you, it would be your job to find an n. In other words, tell me how far out in the sequence you need to go to ensure that the points in the sequence are within epsilon of the limit. Now what I want to do is draw you a picture again to also talk about the node at the bottom. Here is my picture I copied and pasted from above, and it looks like in that picture I have found an n such that every point, every red point to the right of that orange number n, every red point is within that little yellow window. But what if I was to give you another picture with a smaller epsilon, right? So in other words, that little yellow window is a little bit harder to get into. And what I hope that you notice is that orange N that worked before for the epsilon on the, on the left, that doesn't work for this smaller epsilon in my picture on the right. But can you go a little bit farther to the right in order to guarantee that the rest of your points are in that window? And what I hope that you see is maybe if I go like right here, I will call this one another n, or maybe I'll call it just k of epsilon. So the point is, can you find a natural number n that again depends on the epsilon that was maybe given to you in order to ensure that every single point to the right of this now is always gonna be within that little yellow window.